در برنامه پیشین آبانگان بخش نخست گفتگو با سپ ام سیگل نویسنده کتاب Let There Be Water که درباره حکمرانی آب در اسرائیل هست رو با هم دیدیم و شنیدیم. سپ ام سیگل حقوقدانی هست که سالها به عنوان کارآفرین در نیویورک کار کرده اما به عنوان یک شهروند درگیر علاقمند شد به موضوع آب و اومد سالها روی موضوع مدیریت منابع آب در اسرائیل تحقیق کرد و با بیش از 200 نفر گفتگو کرد. هنوز رژیم اشغالگر قدس هست و خیلی ها در ایران هنوز نمیدونن که اسرائیل از سوی اکثر کشورهای جهان به رسمیت شناخته میشه اسرائیل یکی از کشورهای پیشرو در حوزه مدیریت منابع آب هست و با وجود اینکه در برخی از مناطق بیابانیش میزان بارندگی بسیار کمتر از مناطق بیابانی ایران هست اما همون مناطق رو به نقاطی برای تولید میوه و سبزیجات تبدیل کرده و الان جز به صادر کنندگان کالاهای سبز محصول میشه اسرائیلی ها توانستند با میزان آبی که کنترل کردن و تولید کردن این کالاها رو و به قیمت بالاتر بودتن به کشورهای مختلف جهان قله و کالاهای دیگری که آب زیادی بره رو وارد کنند با قیمتی ارزان تر اسرائیل از منابع آبی مختلفی استفاده میکنه از آبهای سطحی، از آبهای زیرزمینی و از فازلاب فازلاب خانگی رو اسرائیل کنترل کامل میکنه و دو مرتبه به حدی میرسونه که حتی امکان شرب هم میتونه داشته باشه اما خب خیلی ها نمیخوان فازلا به بازیافت شده بخورن و اون آب صرف کشاورزی میشه مدیران ارشد منابع آب در اسرائیل در طول سالهای بعد از 1948 توانستند با وضع قوانینی و با ایجاد فرهنگی ویژه شهروندان کشور خودشون رو قانع کنند که با مدیریت دقیق منابع آب میشه کشور رو به سوی وضعیتی بهتر پیش برد چیزی که ما در ایران شاهدش نیستیم فاضلابی که در ایران باهاش سبزی کاری میکنند پاک نیست خب این آبی که شما دارید ملاحظه میکنید فاضلاب شهریه این جلوتر ببینید ببینید که آب فاضلاب شهری دقیقا داره تو این مزاره منتقل میشه و استفاده میشه ببینید این آب فاضلاب شهریه همه سبزی کاری هستش بامی کاری هست گوجه کاری هست زورت کاری هست که به وسیله همین آب فاضلاب شهری استفاده میشه این زباله های هم که این که دوربین نشون بده زبالایی هست که به وسیله همین آب فاضلاب شهری به اینجا منتقل شده متاسفانه هیچ نظارتی وجود نداره و این سبزی ها میاد داخل شهر و من شما استفاده میکنه بایستی توجه بکنیم که مدیریت منابع آب فقط مربوط به صدسازی و یا حفرچاه نمیشه مدیریت فاضلاب از ابتدا تا انتهایی که فاضلاب به وجود میاد تا زمانی که برای کشاورزی استفاده میشه چیزی است که اسرائیلیا درش تخصص زیادی پیدا کردن همچنین اسرائیلی ها توانستند با شیرین کردن آب دریا به روش های مختلف و ارزان قیمت بخشی از مشکلات خودشون رو حل کنند در برنامه قبلی آبانگان بخش نخست گفتگو با سیف ام سیگل نویسنده کتاب Let There Be Water که کتابی درباره حکرانی آب در اسرائیل و تاریخچه اون هست رو با هم دیدید. Quite by chance I attended a session where a uh, senior US government official was speaking about this coming global water crisis. I didn't know anything about it. It was new news to me. He shared all kinds of quite alarming information. And finishing the meeting, I went back to my office and I said to myself, I'm a concerned involved citizen. I need to learn more. The idea that I was going to write a book was the farthest thing from my uh, my mind. And what I did, in fact, was just said, I just want to be smart about this. I want to be able to talk intelligently about this. I want to know more. I started learning more, and what I discovered was this great imbalance, this great gap between the crisis that was at hand and the number of people who actually were aware of the fact of what was coming. And so I decided that what I needed to do was to start educating others. I wrote some articles for major newspapers. I told people about it. I made a couple of speeches. 
And then it became clear to me that the only way I could reach a mass audience was be by writing a book. So I, I wrote the book. I never assumed it would be the success that it was, but here we are. Okay, so yeah. وقتی که انگلیسی ها کلونی یا به بارتی مستعمره خودشون رو ترک می کردن آیا انتظار داشتن که ساکنان جدید و مدیران جدید بتونن وضعیت آب اون منطقه رو مدیریت کنند؟ Well, I don't have to think about this because I know. Because for the research for the book, I went through the British Imperial Archives and there's lots of correspondence about your very question. So I know the answer to your question. I know exactly what they were thinking. They believe that the region and I'm including in that all of Israel today, all of Gaza, and all of the West Bank. They believe that that entire, what they call the envelope, geographic envelope, could hold no more than a million and a half to two million people. They believe that if it went any higher than that, it would be strangled because of a lack of water resources, that they'd be able to grow no food, that there wouldn't be enough room for the people, and that it would lead to a humanitarian disaster. And by the way, they weren't sure that that wasn't going to happen even with fewer than that number of people. How many people live in that same, to use the British phrase, geographic envelope today? 12 million people. And Israel is planning for a future which has 30 million people in that same geographic envelope. So the fact of the matter is that the British did not expect the region to do well, did not expect the region to thrive. They looked at the large land mass of the Negev Desert, which is everything from so the, the bottom two-thirds of Israel. Israel is a long, skinny country, so the bottom two-thirds of the country. And they thought it was a wasteland. They thought it had no value. And as I show in my book, Israel figured out a way to take desert land and then to take brackish, useless water found underneath those desert sands, highly minerally, highly salty water. <clears throat> they invent specialized seeds that thrive on salty minerally brackish water and Israel develops an agriculture industry that does two things not only does it or three things not only does it provide food for the people of the country not only does it provide an export industry for the country but it provides an extraordinary environmental plus do you know that Israel is the only country in the world that in the 20th century ended the century with less desert land than it started in Deserts are growing everywhere. Environmentalists call the phenomenon desertification. And this is creating poverty and problems and environmental catastrophes. Israel has figured out a way to hold the desert back and to expand the green belt. If you have ever flown in a helicopter over Israel, as I have, on the Israeli or Jordanian side, which I did once, it's extraordinary. You look down and you see kind of a lunar moonscape view on half of the border, which is on the Jordanian side. On the Israeli side, where they've developed this desert agriculture, you see green belt after green belt punctuated by those moonscapes. And that's something that's really quite extraordinary and quite exciting. Israeli ha baraye modiriyat abkhan ha che barnameh daashtan? Well, they're governed by, by uh, treaty uh, agreement. Uh, in 1993 and 94, and to some extent in 1995, Israel and the Palestinians and Israel and the, and the Kingdom of Jordan entered into a series of agreements. The Palestinian-Israeli agreements are called the Oslo II agreements. And in that agreement, they set forth exactly how water will be managed. And that Israel, as the more technologically advanced of the two countries, would take primary responsibility for managing and extraction of water. But the Palestinians would be guaranteed a minimum amount of water regardless of weather conditions. So when there are drought years, Israeli farmers get less water, Palestinians still get the same amount of water, in fact more than it's called for under the treaty. They get the water that they have been promised by Israel and, and so that, that works in that way. With the Kingdom of Jordan, likewise, in the peace agreement between Jordan and Israel, which was either 94 or 95, I forget which it was, um, but it was that time frame. Um, they entered into an agreement also about water sharing. Uh, Jordan has, has no natural uh, reservoir to hold water or winter rains. Israel agreed to make use of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Sea of Galilee, the, called in Hebrew the Kinneret, uh, to allow them to store water in the Sea of Galilee. And as they want to, as they want to store it, they put it in. When they want to take it out, they remove it. It's all measured. And it leads to, I argue, it leads to very, very positive uh, interactions between the parties. In addition to the aquifers or the alluvial uh, areas, 
is the idea of maintaining this for the long-term health of everybody. And this has led to some conflict as well. Sometimes Palestinian farmers choose to just drill a well, and Israelis, uh, uh, Israeli forces or Israeli government will come in and cap the well because they are concerned about contamination of the water below it. And that has sometimes led to confrontation. Palestinians say, well, why are you keeping my farmers from, from drilling a well? And they're doing that because there's a precise agreement between the parties as to what's permitted and what's not permitted. Uh, in Gaza, where Israel does not have any involvement in their water management other than to pump water in, there are some 12,500 wells that have been drilled. But here's the bad news. Only about two to 3,000 of them are legal wells. All the rest are illegally drilled. And guess what has happened to the quality of the aquifer? Badly polluted, badly, badly salinized, and badly made more salty. <clears throat> and this is what could happen. There's no guarantee that if, you, that if you abuse nature, that at some point nature won't push back. So Israel shares the aquifers. Some of the aquifers are exclusively in the hands of the Palestinians. They can do whatever they want with it. And, and the shared aquifers, Israel takes primary management responsibility for. Hello, Israel, for example, میاد و آبخانهای خودش رو تغذیه مصنوعی میکنه برای اینکه آب رو برای نسلهای آینده درون آبخانها نگهداری کنه. In some places yes, um, but they there's a, they have a variety of storage uh, means that they use. So for example, and I'll go through some of them. They they're preferred if they're in the northern part of the country, their preferred storage facility is of course the Sea of Galilee. If they are in the uh, south and central part of the country, they have a large number of reservoirs, above ground reservoirs, that have been built out by partnerships between the Israeli government and other not-for-profit environmental organizations that allows them to store water. That water is, only, is almost only the treated sewage. And then in the Negev Desert, when they have the winter rains that come with great force, they only last for a short period of time. They have a recharge methodology whereby they take that storm water and pump it into aquifers for the purpose of storing it and being able to recharge it and to then extract it at a time when it's needed. So the answer is, to your question is, what Israel utilizes is what is sometimes called an all-of-the-above strategy. It's a multifaceted, multidimensional uh, water management system that allows them to do some things that are on the surface, some things that are below the surface in groundwater, and some things that hold the water in abeyance, like with desalinated water that comes in as needed from the ocean. طبیعتاً در روزگاری هستیم که خیلی ها جرأت نمی‌کنن درباره گرم شدن زمین و تغییر اقلیم حرف بزنن چون ممکنه اتهام‌های زیادی بهشون وارد بشه از سوی کسانی که نگاهی محافظه کارانه دارن اما به هر شکل داریم واقعیت ها رو می‌بینیم اسرائیل در این قبال چه برنامه و سیاستی رو اتخاذ کرده So first of all I I I understand exactly what you're talking about the controversy about uh, the whole climate change issue uh, when uh, my book came out a while ago but I've been uh, invited by many groups to speak to them both in the US and around the world uh, I've spoken to hun- now truly there's a real number hundreds of audiences uh, I've been on four continents. I've been in more than 60 U.S. cities. Um, and in some communities, uh, climate change is taken as a given. In some other communities, climate change is seen as some dastardly government plot. And I say to everybody the same thing. I don't need to say to you that climate change is real or not real. It's man-made or not man-made. You can believe whatever you want to believe because I don't want you to start putting your fingers in your ears and, and singing a song so you can't hear the rest of my message. Whatever you want to believe, continue to believe. It doesn't matter. Because what we know for fact is that water resources are growing more scarce. We know that evaporation levels are growing more, more active. And therefore, we know that if you care about our future for tomorrow and the year after tomorrow and five years from now, we must aggressively manage our water. Now, in dry areas like the southwestern United States, or like the Middle East, or, or, or parts of Africa, or parts of Australia, or parts of South America, where there's a very dry area anyway, you have to be doing this even more aggressively. And the message of my book is the fact that Israel, in a very dry region, has figured out a way to have advanced water governance, have an abundance of water so that they have agriculture, so that they have the ability to share their water with the Palestinians and Jordanians, so that everybody in Israel, everybody, turns on the faucet, turns on the shower, and they can have all the water they want, provided they pay for it, and nobody goes without water. 
And that came about not by accident. It came about because of a plan. And my argument is what Israel did in the driest region of the world, a small country that today is affluent but was very poor when it started, when the British left in 1948, that this is something that everyone everywhere could be doing. If not everything Israel has done, people could be doing parts of what Israel has done. So aquifer management is part of it. And, and evaporation management is part of it. Now, one of the things that Israelis are talking about doing, I'm not sure they will because of the expense, they're talking about putting a cover on their reservoirs so that that way it will slow the evaporation rate, in fact, bring it down to zero in some, in some cases. And I think that ultimately that's what they may choose to do. Okay, با آبیاری قطرعی میزان مصرف آب برای تولید کاهش پیدا میکنه کشاورزان ممکنه به این ایده برسند که حالا که آب بیشتری در زیر زمین دارن برای ثروتمند شدن میتونن در نقاط دیگه باز آبیاری کنند و به این ترتیب عملا آبی حفظ نمیشه چرا که کشاورزان برای درآمد بیشتر اومدن اون آبی که صرف جوی شده در جای اول دارن جای دیگه مصرفش میکنن برای مقابله با این پدیده چه باید کرد Israeli system is actually a very smart system because they, um, they try to make centralized use of the groundwater. They try to, I'm sorry, not centralized use, centralized control of the groundwater, I should say. And so um, there, uh, because the water is seen as a common good, people are not permitted, farmers are not permitted to waste the water just because they have the available water. Uh, that, so that's the first thing. Second of all is, uh, by the way, you're asking a question that's as old as man and, and humanity itself. How do you stop people from destroying the future for greedy opportunities of the moment? And so I think that that goes to education. That goes to educating farmers about sustainability and tells them, hey, we'll help you grow more, help you grow more with less water. You might even want to grow more right now, but understand the consequences. That in a few years, you or your children will just not have the water you need to grow the food and the crops that you need. So that if you are prepared to waste your water now, you can, but there's going to be a consequence. You know, for those of us who are careful about the way we live and eat and we're good model citizens or something like that, then you're going to have a better outcome than somebody who goes out every night drinking and using drugs and being reckless and not getting sleep and... and never exercising, you know, you, you, you have consequences as a society, as a family, as individuals, by your good behaviors and your bad behaviors. I think this is a job for government. And if I may say, and I don't know Iran well, I've never, I've never had a chance to visit there, unfortunately, uh, because of the circumstances in 79. And I would love to visit Iran. But I think the government has done a very bad job of educating its farmers. What is the problem is that the farmers are allowed to be as wasteful as they wish with their water in Iran. And part of the reason for that I understand from having interviewed people who would prefer for me not to use their names for understandable reasons because of relatives back in Iran, is that uh, the government wants to have, to sort of sense, buy peace with these farmers and to tell them no you can't would make the farmers angry and resentful. So there are farmers who drill wells that are not sanctioned. There are farmers because energy is so incredibly inexpensive in Iran. There are farmers who just keep the pump going all the time. And the water gets pumped out and it's wasted and the energy is wasted but the water is fundamentally free, the energy is close to free, so farmers are very reckless with their water. And this is part of culture, this is part of education, this is part of smart governance. I say in my book that water problems are a proxy or a substitute for bad governance. And I think that the countries that have bad water systems today, generally speaking, suggest that they had bad governance yesterday. And so therefore, nature is fairly forgiving in the short term. You can be very abusive to nature and get away with it for the short term. But the long term, the more you are in the process of abusing nature, of overusing a resource, sooner or later, you pay a price. And I fear very much that there's going to be a very large price paid by countries of the world that have been reckless or that have tried to buy off their farmers with cheap or free water. 
some of people have said, and I know, I know that I read recently read an excellent article by a fabulous uh, writer from uh, born in Iran, who said that there's a possibility that as many as 50 million Iranians will be relocated from where they live because there's going to become a shortage of water. That is totally unnecessary. With smart governance, with smart planning, with long-range planning, with the use of technology, with proper pricing, none of that is necessary. And how do we know that? That it's not just theory, what I'm saying, but reality? How do we know that? Because Israel in the same region, with the same climate, with the same rapid population growth, in fact, faster even than Iran, has managed to go from being water scarce to being water abundant. So why wouldn't everybody want to do what they have done? You know what? I'll even go farther. Let me go further here. Let's assume that politics, you can't get politics out of your head. Let's assume you just hate Jews, or you just hate Israelis, or you just hate Zionists, and you just can't bear to, to do anything with them, and you don't want to recognize them. Okay, I get it. Why would you sabotage your own people's future? Take from the Zionists, take from the Israelis, take from the Jews what's good and smart, and then ignore the rest. But don't say, oh my God, this drip irrigation comes from, comes from Israel, therefore we want nothing to it's do not with it. Halal. <laughs> it's not halal. It's not halal. Yes, yes. But, but why would you say that? Why would you do that? Why would you sabotage your own people? Take what's good, take what's smart, take what's useful, and then ignore the rest. I would argue that, that good relations and good politics is good for everybody anyway and would lead to peace in the region more quickly, but push that aside. Assume you want to be antagonistic and keep the battle going. Still, fix your water future, and since the Israelis are so good at it, learn from them. یک از دلایلی که خیلی دلم می‌خواست این گفتگو انجام بشه این بود که بسیاری از کارشناسان حوزه آب در ایران خب مسلمانان معتقد شیعه‌ای هستند که نمی‌خوان درباره اسرائیل اصلا چیزی بشنون اما خیلی از همونها دوست دارن چیزی یاد بگیرند یک تضاد درونی برای خیلی از اینها وجود داره شما به عنوان کسی که درباره حکمرانی آب و مدیریت منابع آب در اسرائیل تحقیق کرده چه پیامی برای این افراد دارید چه چیز جدیدی برای این افراد دارید که لاقل بتونن یاد بگیرن که از اون راهکارها برای ایران استفاده کنند Let me say this to the, let me say this to you right now Nick I want to tell you how I feel I wrote this book for a lot of reasons I wrote this book not just about water I wrote this to give an example of great leadership of courage and vision of governance. But I want to tell you something. The book is now out in many dozens of countries around the world. It's out or soon will be out in 15 different languages other than English. But the language that's missing from the list of countries and the language that's missing from the list of languages that I'm desperate to have is Farsi. And let me make an offer right now to your viewers in Iran, your viewers in the United States, your viewers elsewhere around the world. I will give at no cost whatsoever to anybody who comes to me the opportunity to translate the book into Farsi. No royalty payments whatsoever. We have to sign a contract to make sure I still own the copyright. But beyond that, no economic terms whatsoever. For free, for free, for free. If we can print copies, great. If that's a problem or a danger for people to have that in their homes, put it online and let anybody who wants to hear or read the achievements of Israel in water, Israel in hydrology, Israel in smart water governance, be my guest and learn. This is be my gift. I am I identify myself as a friend of Israel. I have no antagonism towards the Iranian people whatsoever. I believe that they have been mostly made victims of their own bad government and that what we're going to see very soon, I mean not like in 100 years, in a few years, we're going to see a major water crisis because of bad management, bad infrastructure projects and all kinds of corrupt deals that are hurting the Iranian people and their water future. <clears throat> read my book in Farsi and English and any of the other language that it's out and come to understand how a smart, good water administration can be handled. سپاس گذارم بخش سوم و پایانی این گفتگو رو در برنامه بعدی آبانگان با هم خواهیم دید دیدین دیدین چندیست بچه هم کارهای مین و مایت که مرا نگران کرده است ای وی چگونه کارهایی؟ مثلا در مسیرهایی که رفت آمد در آن جریان دارد اختلال ایجاد مین و مایت بگذار رد شویم دارم میخواد نگذارم چراخ ها را بی موقع خاموش مین و مایت 
در مسیر ما چاله و گردال ایجاد می نماید از اینجی به من به دوستانش بزر بخشش می نماید نگران بباش که او آیندی روشن دارد چگانه؟ این گانه که شهرداری می شناسم دقیقا همه جوری است با ایجاد پوله های به در نخور به جای روان شدن ترافیک راه بندون ایجاد می کند و با هنگام چراغ های پارک ها را خاموش می کند یابان هایش هی فرو ریخت گودال ایجاد می گردن و بوجه بیتولمال به دوستانش زمین و ملک می بزر بخشد اگه دیدیم بچه هاتون از این شیطنت ها می کنند نگران نباشیم فردا روز کردار مردار می شود قربونی پسرم برم می خواد شهر داشته هر بابا جان هر